This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, Minneapolis. It's time for This Week in Virology. This is episode number 232, and we are recording on May 8th, 2013. Hey, everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today we are coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're on the campus of the University of Minnesota and we are at the 2013 Institute for Molecular Virology Annual Symposium. We've spent the day listening to terrific virology talks by all sorts of researchers here and now we have four principal investigators who are gonna tell us about some of the cool science that's uh, going on here. So this is really nice that people outside there in the rest of the world can hear about the research that's going on here and the research that they pay for with their tax dollars. So joining me today on my right, he's the director of the Institute for Molecular Virology and a professor in the Department of Microbiology, Lou Mansky. Welcome to TWIV. Welcome. And thank you, Winston. Uh, if I get any of your titles wrong, you correct me, because I've done that before. To uh, Lou's right uh, is a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Associate Dean for University Curriculum. New, new job. Leslie Schiff, welcome. Hi, Vince. How you doing? Good. Thanks for joining us. You'll have fun, don't worry. I know. You look worried. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for you. There's a lot of testosterone up here. Yeah. What? <laughs> I know, but uh, what, what, does that mean you'd like to have someone else join you? Some more women. Yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. he, pick, he picked them all. I didn't. <laughs> Lou picked them. There was an eye roll for those of you who can't see. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Leslie's right, the IMV co-director and professor in the department of biochemistry, or maybe it's one department, biochemistry, molecular biology, and biophysics, Reuben Harris. That's right. Thanks. One Thanks, department, Vince. right? One department. Big long name. And you and uh, you and Lou work together to run the institute. Is that right? Um, we work closely together on lots of fronts. <laughs> yep. I think uh, I just come to put out fires. Everybody. At the 11th hour. And everybody's hearing okay so far in the back. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And finally, all the way on the right, very far away, professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the Mayo Clinic, Roberto Catania. Ciao Vincenzo. Benvenuto. Is that, the, is that correct? Perfetto. Possiamo parlare in italiano? Potremmo, potremmo parlare potremmo. in italiano. See, uh, we, we should speak in English for you guys. <laughs> we, we can do this. He's, he knows Italian very well. I remember once you were at a study section and you ran, it was in San Francisco and you ran into some Italians on the street who wanted to know where the Victoria's Secret would open, right? <laughs> <That>. <laughs> And of course, seven, he knew, seven, right? Seven he knew right away. <laughs> and he's talking seven to them. Seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he was talking to them in Italian. I was, I was listening, and I was impressed. I didn't know he could speak such good Italian. Uh, so while, while we're uh, talking about the Institute, um, maybe, Lou, you could tell us a little bit about how it came to be and uh, what you do and all that sort of thing. Sure, I can do that in a, in a nutshell. So the Institute for Molecular Virology at the University of Minnesota was created in late 2003. And this was, it was created at the time of my arrival and my idea to uh, Dr. Frank Sir, who at the time was the senior vice president for health sciences at the University of Minnesota was to create a virology institute that would be the, the focal point for all virus and virus related research in the health sciences as well as at the entire University of Minnesota. And the University of Minnesota is a very large, comprehensive uh, public research university, has lots of different colleges, all the health sciences, biological sciences, physical sciences, engineering, pub, uh, lots of different areas. But unlike, or like many other uh, large, comprehensive universities, people that are working on viruses, including people that would be normally considered the card-carrying virologists, are really scattered all over the place. 
So this was really a vision I had coming to the University of Minnesota was to create this institute as a, as a mechanism of bringing all these types of researchers together. And the beginning was the, the, the really the first stepping stone was to, to hold the, the first annual IMB symposium. And that, in that first symposium, we had uh, two keynote speakers who were both local speakers uh, that are generally well, highly well regarded virologists here at the University of Minnesota. One of them has since has retired, Dwight Anderson. Uh, Dwight has pioneered the study of uh, bacteriophage 529 as a model system for studying viral DNA packaging. And the other, the other keynote speaker was Ashley Haas, who's a world-renowned AIDS researcher studying the early events in uh, HIV pathogenesis. So they were the first two keynote speakers. And nine years ago now, they gave talks. And I remember there was just an absolute rip-roaring response from the audience after seeing everybody present and realizing that uh, what I did, uh, what I had realized from the outside was that there's a lot of outstanding people here doing outstanding research. And there really was no mechanism or vehicle to really bring everybody together in a meaningful manner where they could discuss science. And one of the great things about Minnesota that's an untold uh, truth is that people are very humble here and they're generally fairly modest about their accomplishments. And Dwight Anderson was a perfect example of that. <clears throat> When he gave his talk, he was the second keynote speaker. There was just an outburst of response that I just cannot believe. I remember Jim Lokensgaard is here saying, I didn't even realize this kind of stuff was even going on in Minnesota. And yeah, Dwight had already, at this point, had already been here for like 35, 40 years doing this <laughs> stuff. And it's just, I mean, it just typified the, you know, the whole point was that there was, a, there was a reason and a meaning for you know, having this kind of an institute at this type of a university. And this was originally sold to this administrator, Frank Serra, who believed in my vision to be able to create this. And uh, not long after that, I had engaged uh, Roberto Cantaneo at the Mayo Clinic. And he's always been very good over years about wanting to reach out and make sure that our two institutions are, are as meaningfully as possible working together. So really, the fundamental basis for this is really to you know, create a conduit for virologists and virus researchers, which is a term that I like to use more because many people at many universities, but including Minnesota, actually do work with viruses or study some aspect of viruses or diseases that they cause. And they would not really technically call themselves a virologist, but they really are doing what most of us would call virology research. And, and it's the broadest and most holistic term. So the, the basis for how our institute works is really it's, a, it's primarily an institute without walls. There are groups of us that are physically associated together, and there's opportunities now in the near future to try to bring a more meaningfully larger group of core investigators together. But we've primarily, over the last nine years, worked, nine and a half years now, worked without walls, trying to meaningfully bring people together. And there's lots of success stories of people collaborating with one another, people re finding others on campus through our, our different programmatic activities. It was the basis of this that ultimately led to the funding of an NIH T32 training grant a few years ago. It was also the basis for being able to bring the, the American Society for Virology meeting here two years ago, which you attended. So I think it's been nothing but really extremely positive things. And most people that learn more about who virologists are and what they do really realize it's really way more than what most people would, would typify as being a narrow subdiscipline mm -hmm. in the field of microbiology. Sure. So is it, would it be safe to say that the 10,000 people out here in the audience are, are all members? 20,000, actually. It's, are members of the institute? Yes. So, and this, yep. is your, this is your annual showcase. Really. This is the this annual is, showcase, yep. Is, and, and when are you stepping down? I guess when I, whenever I'm overtaken by, <laughs> by the 20,000 that are out there. <laughs> so uh, you came roughly 10 years ago? About 10, yeah, nine and a half years Tell ago. Tell us about your, your formative years. Where did you start? Uh, I started out, I, I'm a native of Illinois. I uh, grew up there in, near the Chicago area. And I went to undergraduate uh, at Purdue University. Got an undergraduate degree in biology. Did you encounter any of the virologists while you were at Purdue? Uh, I was a pretty shy. I was a real typical, I, I like listening to the faculty here. They love picking on these Midwestern <laughs> students who are relatively quiet, quiet and shy. And I'll just sit there and listen to them pick on these students. and. But I know, in reality, that I was one of those students, too, at one point. So in the early years, I was, I was pretty, pretty shy and not really that interactive with the, with the faculty. So I didn't really, at that time, I was probably, at best, 
uh, classified as being a, a, cl a, a closet virologist. Okay. I was a virologist and didn't really know it, didn't really, couldn't really admit to it because I, I couldn't really come out of the closet about it. So it wasn't until I went to graduate school and I got my PhD in, uh, at Iowa State University. And in and, and those years, I, I became a virologist in my mind when I did my lab rotations and one of the labs was a virology lab. Uh, studying plant potiviruses, which are similar to uh, poliovirus uh, in that it's a it's a positive they're, they're a group of, it's a large it's the largest group of plant viruses RNA plant viruses uh, positive strands mm -hmm. are single stranded RNA and in those years I guess I went to graduate school really interested and excited about uh, plant molecular biology and and not knowing exactly what it was I was going to be studying but and then wound up one of the rotations was in a in a virology lab. So once I joined the lab, then I, I think I convinced myself that I was really mm -hmm. interested in virology. And then ever since then, looking back, I could see that uh, I had actually been led to where I'm at now. Different classes, different courses. And I always like quizzing students about this because I realized that, that the seeds for my interests of today really came from different classes, seminars, meetings I went to, things I would pick up on and found interesting to me all accumulated into leading me to where I'm at scientifically in terms of my interest, that it was accumulated, an accumulative process, at least you know, for my path, that led me there. And in the, the graduate school years, I was actually studying what now would be called host restriction factors. I was interested in studying a molecular basis for uh, resistance to viral infection, which in plants are called resistance genes, but we would basically call, at least retrovirologists would call that those restriction factors, that yeah, they're restricting yeah. viral replication. So in those days, which, you know, that was like five years ago, of course, right, when I was in graduate school, that they were described as being the resistance genes, and because of the engineering, you could, you know, make plants resistant by crossing them and, right. and including those, those resistance genes in the plant. So that was my graduate school years, and research was focused on that. When I graduated, uh, I decided uh, a lot of students stay focused in what they're doing. I was, I, I made the decision to stay in virology, which I'm, I'm still happy to say I did that. One of the reasons why I did is because I went to the ASV meeting as a student and enjoyed the diversity of uh, viruses that are out there in nature and the different, the, the intrigue of all the different diseases and all the different things you can do with viruses, viruses as tools to study cell function and, and structure. Uh, as models for understanding diseases and the, mo their, the molecular basis for that, all the various things that people do that, to study viruses. And at that time, I just decided that I was really excited about retroviruses and HIV. It was, as it still is, it's still you know, one of our, our most important viruses in terms of dealing with it and the, the threat it, it continues to make on, on human health. And I looked around, and I was fortunate enough to be invited to join the lab of Howard Timmon at Wisconsin. And that, that being the beginning of my a career as a retrovirologist. What year was that? That was uh, 1990. So we were already well into the AIDS pandemic. By we were already into that, but I was the first person in Howard's lab that actually worked with HIV. Up until uh -huh. then, he was really primarily focused on, uh, at those times, the chicken retroviruses. So I was really the first person to get reagents in the Timon lab to actually start doing experiments with HIV. Right. So then wh where was your first position? Uh, first position I did, I was a faculty member for one year at the Creighton University School of Medicine in Omaha. Right. And I was there for one year and then went from there to Ohio State University in Columbus in the medical school microbiology mm -hmm. department. And I was there for six and a half, six years, and then moved here with my wife, Kim, who's also a, a PhD a molecular biologist trained in virology. She got her PhD with Paul Lambert at the UW Madison, papillomaviruses. Mm -hmm. papillomaviruses. And, uh, and began uh, developing my research career there. The two research areas that my lab has been interested in over the years are things related to HIV genetic diversity and things related to retroviral assembly. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's pick one thing. You do a lot of things in your lab. Let's pick one thing to talk about a bit. Um, what aspect of your work do you, would, you like to, would you like to talk about error thresholds, antivirals? You, you, you call. You, you call. I call what, it? What do you, yeah, what do you think is you want to talk about? All right, about? so this error threshold concept is very interesting. We just had a talk from one of your yep. lab members, so it's yep. fresh in my mind. And this is something that's been done with poliovirus. You can treat polio with ribavirin. Yes. Yep. And for years, we didn't know how ribavirin worked as an antiviral. But it turns out it 
pushes polio over the error threshold. Mm -hmm. You only need to increase the mutation frequency two or threefold right, right. to do that. And so it's the same with HIV, essentially? Uh, yeah, I think experiments that we've done in more recent years, uh, Michael Dapp, who's sitting up in the front here in the audience, is one of these people that's done these kind of experiments with different uh, nucleoside analogs showing mm -hmm. that you can just uh, lead to a small increase in the mutation rate and mm -hmm. basically cause uh, virus extinction that are primarily driven by uh, elevation in virus mutational loads. Okay. So these are nucleoside analogs that do not terminate, but rather they template right. the wrong base. Yep, right? they template the wrong base. So they, they allow, they don't uh, terminate reverse transcription from occurring. So is this a viable therapeutic approach for people? I remember years ago, being talked about in that vein. Right? Yep, so uh, uh, Michael Dapp was the first author of a review article that was recently published in Trends of Vi uh, in Microbiology. At least in, there's two ways of looking at this entire field. There's all, mostly all the work that's been done by uh, virologists looking at various RNA viruses, including poliovirus, and then the, the stuff with HIV, which is a little bit different. Um, that at least if we just focus in on HIV, that there, there's basically two phases of, of studies that relate to this. There was the, the original phase that began with Jim Mullins and Larry Loeb at the University of Washington, Seattle, where they had identified the uh, molecules that, that could basically recapitulate a lethal mutagenesis phenotype in tissue culture. And there was a, a tremendous, that was the initial uh, excitement from that, and there was uh, grants awarded, and people were excited, hey, this is something different. And like many areas or many topics in AIDS research, after a couple of years, people got bogged down in the complexities of it. It's not as easy. It's a lot more complicated. People were having difficulty uh, basically demonstrating the results in their own labs from what was published in this one PNES paper. And then you know, the fanfare died down. And it's like, well, let's just move on to something else, which is what the AIDS field does, is that once it gets too complicated, it kind of dies down. Let's move on to the next hot topic. And so it took a few years. And really, the, the second phase was really the beginning of uh, the discovery of the, these uh, cytosine deaminases that are called the Apovec 3 proteins. And what came from that was this concept that in nature, through evolutionary time, there have been uh, cellular defense mechanisms. And if we focus specifically in on Apovec 3G with HIV-1, that I think that there's a an abundant amount of literature, and uh, Ruben Harris might comment more about this, but the bulk of the <laughs> literature is really quite clear that the primary antiviral mechanism by which Apovec 3G restricts HIV-1 replication is through cytosine deaminated mediated mutation, which in the positive strand of the, the viral genome is, is typified by GDA hypermutation. Mm -hmm. So that to me really meant something really important, and that is that in nature, we could identify a, a molecular mechanism by which cells can restrict and prevent H, uh, lentivirus or HIV replication, in this case, by lethal mutagenesis. So it's a natural way of cells pushing the virus over the threshold. Yeah. That's so to me, that, that was really yeah. important. And it's like, well, you know, we're trying to, ultimately, what we're really trying to do is just find ways that we scientists can mimic something that really, there's lots of different ways of how you might approach that right, scientifically. Right. And our way is just go, kind of going back to the well and trying to find simple ways of looking at non-canonical base pairing mm -hmm. to try to introduce mutations. Can you and, name some of these drugs that are used? Uh, like Michael Dapp has used 5-Azacitidine. Uh, five, five a former postdoc in the lab, Christine Clauser, had used uh, Decidabine, which is a related mm -hmm. cytosine analog, and all, which is also one of these non-canonical base pairing uh, nucleosides, and then uh, another one that she had used is called gemcitabine. Mm -hmm. Those are both uh, anti-cancer mm -hmm. drugs. Uh, gemcitabine is a, you'd heard this in the last talk prior to the beginning of the TWIV, that's a um, ribonucleotide reductase inhibitor. Right. So these are not drugs that are given to people at the moment, is that correct? They are, well, they're given for their cancer indication, cancer indication but not, okay. uh, you would have to give it off-label. So they or are FDA approved, so it would be They are FDA approved. They, they could be prescribed off-label for other uses. Mm -hmm. The problem with, the, they're used primarily, at least like decidabine and gemcitabine, these are anti-cancer drugs. So they're in a normal indication, they're given at very high doses for short periods of time intravenously. And most people infected with HIV are normally taking daily doses orally. So one of the things that we've been working on is identifying prodrug derivatives that could be orally available mm -hmm. for, right, these, right. for these molecules. But we do have triple therapy, right? So what would be the advantage of developing another approach? Uh, the, 
it, it goes back to if, you, if we look at the history and our knowledge about antibiotics that we know that ultimately as microbiologists that microbes develop antimicrobial mm -hmm. drug resistance and certainly with viruses and with HIV that we know that ultimately HIV will find a way of developing resistance to the drug. So there's, there is always, there's, there's certainly older infected individuals that are in uh, serious salvage therapy that are always looking for new treatment options because they've failed everything else. Right. Well, one of your lab members said today it's really hard to get resistance, HIV mutants that are yeah. resistant to these drugs. Yeah, and, and unpublished data from our lab, it's, and actually in general there's not many examples where you can readily select for resistance mm -hmm. to these viral mutagens. So do doesn't you, mean that you can't do it, does, it course, just means yeah. that it's not quite as straightforward as, as you would conceptually think it is. I'm getting a phone call, nice. <laughs> um, so Hopefully it's not a, a disgruntled listener. No, it's one of my <laughs> colleagues, colleagues at ASM who helps me a lot with okay. my podcast. He would like to be on the show, I guess. I should answer it. Um, do, so for polio polymerase, we know one residue that if you change it, it makes the polymerase make fewer errors. Is mm -hmm. there such a thing for the HIV? There, there certainly are HIV-1 you know, reverse transcriptase yeah. mutants that are, have single amino acid substitutions that have higher fidelity. Right. Have, so have you tried those against these uh, mutagens? And so uh, yeah, we have done that. But they're not, they, they don't uh, have a uh, resistance bearing no, okay. phenotype per se. All right. All right. So do you think that you could eradicate HIV with drugs only? Well, there's, there's certainly in, in, in the AIDS research community, there's an intensive amount of interest right now of trying to eradicate the, the latent reservoirs. So I think that there's a lot of uh, cautious optimism that you know, there's a lot of people doing lots of different things. You know, these types of you know, lethal immunogenesis approaches could be helpful in terms of getting rid of residual virus that might mm. be coming out. So I think that a lot of the AIDS researchers now are really quite intensely focused on trying to eradicate reservoirs. And certainly, if, if you were able to do that, that would certainly lead closer to something that might be perceived as being a cure. In the news just a couple of weeks ago, there was something about a, a Danish trial of histone deacetylase inhibitors. Yep. You probably saw that, yep. thinking that this is the solution. Yeah, the people have been working on these uh, yeah those types of inhibitors for a while and it's it's just like what I was telling you about the, the original experiments with yeah. these it's more complicated and uh, I usually tell people you know there's always a few people out there that think that you know researchers aren't working as hard as they should and they should be able to cure <laughs> these things and I can assure you with the, the people that I know that are in AIDS research that they are accomplished enough and bold enough that if they were if they knew they would be the one to get credit for curing AIDS, they would have done it already. It had been done a long, long time ago. So I can yeah. assure you that, that this is a real problem. It's really, really complicated. And it's still amazing to this day, 30 years later, that you know, in the early years, people thought for sure that the way to, to deal with the HIV infection was through vaccination. Mm -hmm. that, that's another mm -hmm. area that's really been a very, very complicated problem. So uh, many people feel that these drugs should be given prophylactically, especially to yep. high risk groups. What do you think about that? Um, well, I think that there may be, ins I don't know if across the board that's necessarily mm -hmm. a good idea or that practical, but I think there probably are groups of individuals where that might yeah. be helpful in terms of preventing transmission. Yeah, I mean, probably not in the U.S. because of our new cases is, yes. is, is low compared to it's say Africa. It's relatively right? low compared to In other countries as well, but yeah. there might be a, a, role, a role for that. All right, let's, uh, thank you. You're Lou. welcome. Uh, let's move on to Leslie. And, uh, I know that you are from the Fields Lab originally, but where did you actually start? I grew up in New York. Wow, um, really? Yeah. Where, New York in, City? It, no, in Westchester, uh -huh. New Rochelle. New Rochelle. Um, and then I went to Brown University, was a biology major. Uh, wow. And then I got waitlisted at Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was at Brown, and then my younger brother didn't get in, so I must have really messed it up. Um, and then I went to graduate school at Tufts, uh, and I was an immunologist when immunology was relatively simple. This was uh, the medical school, or at the medical school, in, yeah, right in Boston, right in, in Chinatown. And yeah. was John Coffin there at the time? And John Coffin was on my thesis committee. Wow, great. Um, and but you did immunology, you say? I did immunology with Naomi Rosenberg. So okay. um, her, her lab worked on Abelson murine right. leukemia virus. So I was a retrovirologist, and her lab used that virus um, to study immunoglobulin gene rearrangement. Mm -hmm. 
but I became more interested in the virus as a virus and not as a mm -hmm. tool for immunology. There were too many CD molecules I and agree. IL I totally molecules, <laughs> and you know it was beyond my capabilities. Naomi, by the way, was a Baltimore postdoc. Yes, I know. Before yeah. my time, though. I know. Yeah. Um, then John Coffin was a Temin postdoc before my time as it's well. It's a small yeah, world. Small world. <laughs> it's a small world. Yeah. Um, or he was a graduate student. I'm sorry. He was a, he was a PhD student at Howard Temin. Temin lab. Okay. Well, and John taught the virology course that I took as an immunology graduate student, and I just I loved it. Um, and so was Elio Schechter there? The Elio Schechter was there. Yep. Okay. Um, so I decided when it was time to to look for a postdoctoral fellowship that I would be a virologist, and Boston is a great place to look mm -hmm. for virology labs, and I looked at a lot of them. Um, and I talked to Bernie Fields, who um, was the chairman of the Department of Microbiology um, and Molecular Genetics at Harvard Medical School, and Bernie had this ability, if you walked into his office, to somehow hypnotize you. People used to say, don't look in his eyes. Because, <laughs> really, because he would, conv you'd go in mad about something, and he'd convince you that everything was okay, and you'd walk out of the office and say, what just happened in there? You know, like I didn't really get anything that I wanted to get accomplished, accomplished, except that he made you feel better. Um, but I remember being in his office and him talking about the virus, and he took out a picture, a micrograph, of real virus cores on an EM mm. grid, and the, you, you might even be able to visualize this picture with the messenger RNAs coming out of the vertices, and I thought, that is just so cool, <laughs> and, and that was it. I just decided that you know, this was as good as anything. So you did a postdoc in Bernie's lab? So I did a postdoc in Bernie's lab with um, a cast of thousands. So uh, Terry Dermody was there at the Terry, time? Terry was there, Barbara Sherry was there, okay. Skip Virgin was there, Ken Tyler was there. Wow. There was, um, it was a dynamic and slightly competitive <laughs> group, um, but fun. Max Nyberg was there as a graduate student. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so. then after that? And after that, in 1990, I came here. Wow, right to here, to Minnesota. Yeah. yeah, and so I hope that this is my first and last job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know so. that. I, that Columbia is my first, yeah. and I hope, and it will probably be my last because I'm much older than you are. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> um, and so I thought I would talk to you about teaching virology because it's something that I got into recently, and I want to know how you do it here. So. Um, I do it just like you do it, <laughs> because your book, Principles of Virology, uh -huh. I think is just a fabulous way to teach mm -hmm. virology. I, you know, I learned virology as, I probably shouldn't say this because there'll be listeners who do it this way, the death march through the, you know, yeah, today's yeah. polio. Um, you know, tomorrow we're doing flaviviruses and we're just going to work our, work right. our way up. And that was how I was taught. But I, I don't think that that's the best way to conceptualize virology. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I teach to microbiology majors and biochemistry majors and genetics majors. And I think it's such a fabulous subject to integrate all of these things, you know, biochemistry, genetics, cell biology. It's everything. It's all of those things. And, and to take a really conceptual approach, I hope, leaves students with, with some general principles that when the details fall away, you know, in another three weeks, um, yeah. they'll, uh, you know, the exam is a week from tomorrow. The final exam is a week from tomorrow. That they'll, that they'll remember some big principles, and that's the way, that's mm -hmm. the way I try yeah. to. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. I who, who likes being taught viruses by virus? Is anyone? You can raise your hand. I, we won't mind. Nobody. No. You oh, do. somebody. That's okay. okay. Somebody, somebody uh, no, there are a lot of people. My, many of my colleagues say they can't use the book because our virology book is written by process, right? And they say I can't teach that way. But I think, as you said, that's how you learn virology. You can then have an advanced course where you go into each virus if you'd like. To I, I will tell you that teaching virology, the you know, sort of vi step life cycle step right. by life cycle step and and collecting those big picture I, you know mm -hmm. how can we figure something out using first mm -hmm. principles when i go to asv 
I bet I pay attention more than 90% of the people in the audience because I know, I know enough to be interested and to stay with it. Um, yeah. And so I think it's really, it's helped me professionally too. So, so this um, is an undergraduate It's course? an undergraduate How course. How many students do you have? Um, I have a, anywhere between 40 and 50. Mm -hmm. And then some co uh, cohort within that is writing intensive. Mm -hmm. University of Minnesota has a writing enriched curriculum project. And so with a subsection of those students, because I couldn't deal with it for all 44 of them, right, right. Um, we, do, we do more work around writing. And do you have exams throughout the course? I do I have presume? exams. These are short answer, multiple choice? Uh, a little bit of everything, everything for everybody's, all across blooms for everybody's learning style. And tell us some of the lecture titles, just to get a sense of. Well, you know, I pretty much go, you know, I go by, I, I go by the book. Um, so we do, uh, we do entry, we do um, RNA virus replication, you know, mm -hmm. we do translational control. Um, and we've, we've gotten ourselves all the way, um, all the way to the bitter end. And then in the last week, because I'm so, I do it basically all myself, except my husband, Steve Rice, comes in and does one on uh, herpes viruses and, and persistent infections. Um, but uh, the last week, I'm too tired to, to lecture. And so the <laughs> students are, uh, are giving presentations in groups on emerging viruses, so I let them pick, they're in groups of, of two or three, um, and, and it's amazing. We had the first set on Tuesday, and we'll have the next set tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Um, I'll bring bagels since it's the last day of class. Um, but they can talk like, vi you know, I, I was just blown away. They talk like virologists now because they have to introduce the virus, which mm -hmm. might be one that's related to something that we've talked about but not the same, and they can talk about a life cycle talk about an entry mechanism, uh, and then talk about transmission, and then talk about the things that relate, and make them read the chapter in the book, and then they talk about, about things that impact emergence, and right. you know, all in seven minutes. So it's they awesome. present it in front of the class. They present right? it in and front of the class. And that's part of the grade. And that's part obviously, of the grade, right? yeah. Do you do any other things besides that, and exams to, that contributes to the grade? I, well, they have three, um, three exams and a final, okay. comprehensive final. Do you do any weekly quiz type things? Um, I use clickers. Clickers, yeah, um, very good which helps me because I, I can talk really fast. Mm -hmm. um, and so this forces me to slow down. And, and you know, when you ask a clicker question and it's true-false and the, and the responses come up on the screen that it's 50-50, um, that's a teachable moment. Um, sure. No, so. those are great. Yeah, I've, I've thought of, <laughs> of doing clickers, but it's really it. fun. Yeah, I think most of the students at Columbia have them. They buy them for all of their yeah. courses. So I could do it, but I just haven't done it. And with 190 this year, it's a little, it's a little it's, harder. You know, I, it's totally scalable, right? Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it's, when, it's when you're faced with their confusion on the spot. Um, and so sometimes I use them to go back and ask them about things. You know, virology is cumulative. That, that understanding yeah, sure. is cumulative. And so if they don't understand what I said two weeks ago about large T and E2F and, and DNA replication for the virus, then when we're talking about transformation mechanisms, they're not going to understand yeah. other things. And so the clickers are a great, great way to hold them accountable. For, so how, how many total lectures do you have in the course? Um, it's 15 weeks, so there are 30 sessions. 30 sessions, and OK. And 75 uh, minutes. And these, do, is there a prerequisite for the course? There are um, prerequisites for with general micro, okay. um, biochemistry, and genetics. And um, you, you don't teach any other advanced course, just this one, right? Um, I, I actually do. I, yeah. I'm also teaching a, um, a support course for the College of Biological Sciences thesis writers. It's a two semester mm -hmm. sequence, mm -hmm. so they write their introduction and literature review in mm -hmm. the fall and then they write pretty much everything else in the, in the spring and we have an NSF 2's 2 grant, Transforming Undergraduate Education grant together with Duke, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Morgan State to understand, we're, so we're surveying and we're going to analyze those theses um, across the institutions mm -hmm. to understand what are the factors that contribute to s success and you know, yeah. sort of around thesis writing. But you don't record your lectures, right? I do not, because I'm shy. Really? 
Oh, really? <laughs> but it's I am. <laughs> But it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, you're, you're giving the lecture anyway in front of students, so you know, you would have something like that know, in front of you. I know, I know. And I'll tell you, I they like, love that. I know Some of them listen oh, stop, Vince, five, please. six, seven times to each lecture. But on top of that, then you get the 90,000 people out in the restaurant. I don't want those. You don't want those? <laughs> I don't want to be compared to you. No, no. You're, you're out you. there. I think many people have to do that. There are many ways of of teaching yeah. virology and people can use multiple viewpoints and uh, the more of us that do it then other fields will adopt it as well. We're All right, when you use clickers, I'll consider. <laughs> um. I might do it next year. I'm thinking of doing an advanced I'm thinking of doing an advanced course in a year or two because I know a lot of these students are really into it after this and they want more. So I could see taking 30 or 40 of them and then going into a mm -hmm. couple of viruses very yeah. deeply, you know. It's hard it's hard, you know, when you do do what you and I do, and, and you know, I use the whole book pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, in each in each chapter, I'm picking my points because you can't. Yeah. You know, it's pretty dense, right? right? Um, but do you um, have them read excerpts along the way? Do you give them reading assignments? They're supposed to read your book. Yeah, that's um, what I do. For every lecture, I give a reading lecture. assignment yeah. as well. But I'm not sure beyond that. There must be a better way to use it. But I'm not. I'm not sure how to. Uh, yeah, I think you know. I I make slides. My slides are. You know, similar to yeah. your slides, um, and I, I've tried over the years. You know, everybody gives PowerPoints now. They, the students want the PowerPoints ahead of time, sure. so I do that and I, I post them. Um, but students think that everything is on the slide, right? Mm -hmm. If you showed us, if you gave a slide packet with everything on the slide, the slides would be terrible. Yeah. Um, and so I have to say, no, the slides are a map. The slides are my talking points, and they're your map to go back to the book and to find those parts of the book that I used, that I read, to, to make the slides. Um, and so, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a disconnect. Yeah, no, um, I, I feel the there. same way. My slides are an outline. I don't want to have a lot of text on the slide. Right. That would be right. terrible. In fact, in the first year I did it, I think I had a lot of text, and one of the comments was, uh, you have too much, too many words. That's on your right. Slides. You're reading, you know, you're reading right. your slides. So yeah, I cut it way back, and then you get the other complaints that right. there's not enough right. on the slide. But I do the same. I give the slides out before the lecture, and then after that, I provide them with the recording. And um, they say that, and in fact, out of the 190 students who were registered this year, half of them come to each class, mm -hmm. and it's the same half that, who tell me they just like sitting there listening, and they learn better that way. Well, there is you know. something about. You know, for me, teaching is about relationships, and so yeah. I, you know, I like to be in there and and see the students and and know yeah. their names and talk to them, and and that's what makes it fun for me. No, I, I agree totally. I think seeing someone there every day and then having them ask questions and watching them absorb is is the great part of it. And then at the end, when they say, you know, I didn't know what viruses were, and now I love them. I'm going to do a PhD on them. I think that's the it's best the thing. It's the students we can do. who write me years later emails like this, and that I couldn't make this up. Dear Dr. Schiff, you probably don't remember me, but I sat in your classroom you know, <laughs> three years ago, and now I'm in a school of public health in Boston, and every time I sat in your classroom, I was just almost sick. Um, but, but now, <laughs> what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, Why were they you know, sick? Because of hearing viral, well, about viral Well, I don't think so. I think things? because it's hard, because yeah. I think you know, if, if you do it this way, if you hold them accountable for really thinking about things and figuring stuff out, um, making predictions, it is hard. Yeah. And virology is yes. really integrative. And, and yeah, you, you, need to, you need to pull all of that stuff together in order to understand. M many of my students tell me they become germaphobes after <laughs> taking the course. Because I'm always telling them how many viruses are floating around and on the subway poles and all that. One year, I, I was talking about environmental viruses, and I said, can you imagine how many viruses there are on those greasy subway poles in New York City? And the next <laughs> class, one of the students handed me a swab in a tube. He had gone into the subway. He took a <laughs> sterile swab, and he swabbed the pole. And I said, well, thank you very much. I don't know what I'm going to do with one, but it's, it's when they're sitting in class chewing on their <laughs> pens that you know, makes me crazy. Yeah, the pens are going away, though, very, very quickly. Um, so you're going to keep teaching, right? I'm going to, te I'm going to keep teaching. And you know, I'm kind of scaling back mm -hmm. um, my lab. 
somewhat because I've taken on some yeah. some institutional um, undergraduate education related activities. So that's the future for you to be more and more involved in education. Yeah. We'll see. But I won't stop teaching because it's fun. You'll teach forever. I think so. Yeah, I agree. I love it too. It's beyond when my lab is, is closed, I, I will do it as well. I, I just think it's so much fun. It's, the reason I think it's fun beyond what we've said is that we are we have done the research, so we have a feeling in here. We, or we, as someone used to tell me, it's the fire in your belly for it. So when you get up, you're evangelizing yeah. more yeah. than anyone who's, who can, who has never done it. They, they just don't have the same passion. So I think that's where it comes from. All right. Uh, we actually have a couple of emails here. You have to remind me later to get to them, okay? Okay, I, I, may I will forget, do that. But Ruben, yeah. I want to talk to you. Can we talk about APOBEC? Sure. Is that something you are interested in? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard time keeping quiet before. You could have said anything at any time, and Roberto, you too, and you guys can chime in. But uh, tell us, we have not talked about APOBECs on TWIB. And those of you who listen, that's correct, right, Michael? And 232 guys, episodes yeah. and no APOBEC? No, I don't believe so. That's unbelievable. And we've had certainly a lot of retrovirology on, um, but I don't know why. So here's your chance to, and we have lots and lots of listeners, thousands awesome. and thousands, not billions and billions yet, but thousands so and first thousands. I'm really excited to know if restriction factors are featured in your textbook. Uh, yes, they are. They are. Awesome. But before we do that, I forgot to ask you, Let's hear, let's hear your history. So my history uh, started at the University of Alberta as an undergraduate genetics student. So you're Canadian. I'm a Canadian uh -huh. from a cold, wind, uh, windy place called Saskatchewan. And uh, I went to the University of Alberta because it was the closest, you know, in Canadian scale, that's about 1,000 kilometers away, uh, genetics program. And then... Uh, and then uh, was delighted to do, so my undergraduate was pretty interesting. The first year I nearly failed. Uh, I like to tell undergraduate students that because I wasn't very interested or focused on what I was doing. Uh, but after that, the classes got a lot more interesting, actually, once they got a little more specialized and you could actually see the, the bigger picture developing. And uh, did all right, and then started getting into research. And then that's when the lights really went on because um, I loved it. It was super fun. And uh, it was fun enough that I even agreed to stay and do my PhD at the same institution, which I personally don't counsel students to do, but it's an okay path. Um, and that led to um, a bunch of papers very quickly. And then I was interested in mechanisms of mutation in E. coli. And um, I've always been interested in mechanisms of mutation. And that work led me to um, being interested in bigger mechanisms or other mechanisms of mutation. And as a postdoc, I went to work with Michael Neuberger in Cambridge, England, at the Lab of Molecular Biology to uh, get a handle on the mechanism of antibody diversification. Because at the time, all we knew is that you know, billions of different antibodies were produced by VDJ recombination. And then after that, they underwent this mysterious process called somatic hypermutation. And uh, at the time, they really didn't know how it happened. And, um, you know, a lot of events transpired that led to uh, the cloning of AID by Tasuko Honjo's lab and our lab demonstrating that it was a DNA mutating enzyme. And actually, you know, this, so the story unravels scientifically because um, when I cloned human AID, I cloned a bunch of aid-like cDNAs. And that turned out to be several of the Apobec family members. Mm -hmm. And the big surprise was all of these things had the capacity to mutate DNA. And so that led to lots of questions um, general ones, like what are all these enzymes doing? Are they helpful or harmful? And uh, at the same time, uh, Michael Malum's lab cloned Apobec 3G. He called it SEM15 initially um, and reported that it had an HIV inhibiting activity. It was a dominant inhibitor of HIV replication. And then we collaborated together to, uh, to test the DNA deamination, DNA deamination hypothesis. So that sort of um, dumped me directly into the field of retrovirology. Um, hmm. Otherwise, uh, I'm sure it would have passed me by really fast. <laughs> so either get on the train or, um, you know, take another train. Did, and so. did you come here out of your Cambridge post? So I did. So 10 years ago this summer, I came here to Minnesota. And um, according to those at my job interview, I only talked about antibody diversification. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, but my lab pr primarily, um, over the last decade, has worked on uh, the mechanism of HIV restriction by several of the human Apobex, including Apobex 3G, and uh, a broader interest of these proteins in innate immunity 
and recently uh, in cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, what does Apobec stand for? I could make something up. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's just a word. I wanted to name our first child Apobec, and <laughs> my wife would, <laughs> wouldn't let me do that. And even the Thank dog goodness. didn't get the name Apobec. Uh, but it stands for Apolipoprotein B mRNA Editing Catalytic Subunit 1 after the first Apobec that mm -hmm. was identified as a biochemical factor. That I thought he actually didn't know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering too for a second there. Like, oh, it, it could, could so the, the first Apobec, Apobec 1, was cloned as a factor that can convert single, uh, single cytosine in the mm -hmm. ApoB mRNA into uracil. Okay. And so that was a big time, a big deal in the, uh, in the 80s when it happened because um, it opened up another dimension of coding potential in the mRNAs because now you could change the RNA code by editing. And so there are like a bazillion examples of editing now, and this is just one small example of mm -hmm. mRNA editing. Right. But the, the bigger thing is the Apobex are DNA mutators. Okay. And so. So t tell us about it in the context of HIV restriction. How does that work? So this concept of lethal mutagenesis. Um, so the Apobex can clearly crush a virus's infectivity in just a single round. Mm -hmm. um, so an example. Uh, is that several of the Apobex that are restrictive, if the virus's counter defense mechanism, um, which in the case of HIV is VIF, mm -hmm. isn't present, then a single virus can accumulate um, up to 10% of its cytosines converted to uracils in a single replication round. So that's pretty lethal. Most of those don't make it out for another round of replication. Um, a few can sneak by, um, but in the, pres in the wild type, situation with VIF present for HIV, um, it's actually a pretty good apobec um, antagonist. Mm -hmm. And so VIF functions, um, it sort of sets up a, you know, a, a host pathogen interaction where it functions to take out the apobex by triggering their degradation through an E3 ubiquitin ligation complex. And um, so in a wild type scenario, uh, the virus is actually not inflict, you know, apobec is not inflicting lethal levels of mutation. But if it opens up the possibility to, you know, kind of like the, the nucleoside analogs Lou was talking about, if we can inhibit VIF, you can crush the virus's replication mm -hmm. that way. So where does this, um, in the absence of VIF, where does the mutagenesis occur in the cell? At what level? Um, so in the absence of VIF, apobec proteins, at least with HIV as a model, um, work by gaining access to the viral particle during assembly. Okay. So there's an RNA um, gag dependent interaction that occurs that facilitates the packaging of the apobec proteins into the core of the viral particle. Mm -hmm. And then when that particle reaches a new target cell during reverse transcription, the apobecs can attack the cytosines and convert them to uracils. Okay. So it's sort of a, it's a Trojan horse-like mechanism because the apobec has to get in in the producer cell in order to, uh, um, right. you know, affect its damage in the target cell. So when VIF is present, then that, that packaged apobec is degraded in the target cell. Is that in a producer works? cell. So in VIF, producer cell. VIF flushes okay. the apobec army out of the producer cell. Okay. Uh, mostly. Okay. So, so there's, you know, an important additional idea I want to introduce maybe. So there's this concept of lethal mutagenesis, but at the same time, there's pretty good evidence out there that the apobecs are contributing to some of that high degree of HIV variation. Right. I think we saw a slide today where you know there's a cluster of RNA viruses, and HIV was one of those RNA viruses with a high mutation mm -hmm. rate. Um, so there's an idea out there that apobecs actually contributing a significant amount to this high degree of um, mutation in HIV and um, that the virus may be actually using VIF, exploiting VIF, to generate this higher level of mutation. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a video or a picture. It's both. So, <laughs> so if the virus is using VIF for this mutation, that actually raises the question of what happens if we actually got rid of apobec. So has, mm -hmm. have the lentiviruses like HIV hijacked VIF to benefit from a higher mutation rate? So it actually raises the alternative hypothesis that we've advanced in the literature of hypomutation. So if we could actually cut down, counterintuitively, cut down the level of apobec mutagenesis, mm -hmm. slow down the rate of virus evolution, make a smaller you know, number of viruses in an individual to deal with, 
and maybe the immune system could take care of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like most normal viruses. This is the opposite of your strategy, yeah. to drive it into extinction by hypermutation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to restrict its mutational landscape, basically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I can actually argue both sides of the coin, you know? <laughs> it's good for grants. About most things. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but, but I think they both really need to be tested. And, yeah. you know, we haven't, as a field, we haven't advanced the test far enough to, um, you know, to add the molecules, the magic molecules, to let Apivac do its job or to shut it down in a, in a you know, in a good in vivo model. We haven't done that yet. Has not been done. So you, do, you haven't tried taking away April back and seeing the effect? It's kind of it. hard because there's a bunch of them. Um, you, so, so you've got to kill the swarm. It's not just 3G that... You know, it's, it's at least for HIV. So nice work in my lab by Judd Hultquist and Eric Refslin, hmm. um, among others in the field, um, have shown that at least four are probably contributing to virus restriction. Mm -hmm. um, 3D, 3F. Um, Apobec 3 D and Apobec 3 F are um, explain a large part of one part of the mutation pattern, and then Apobec 3 G another part, and then there's a wild card called Apobec 3 H that's still kind of um, questionable because there are at least seven different haplotypes in this room probably of mm -hmm. Apobec 3 H, and some of them are potent mutators and some of them are not. So uh, are these all antagonized by VIF? All of them. Yeah. So that's the other thing. VIF, VIF is a contortionist. It can take down multiple apobecs hmm. through the same ubiquitin-dependent mechanism. So you can presumably knock out one apobec from a, a mouse. Can you do that, or do they not have it? No, so that's an additional. It does have an apobec, one, just one single apobec, three gene. Murine. And yeah. it is a little different than any of the human genes mm -hmm. because it's... it's um, uh, a two-domain gene that uh, has two different phylogenetic flavors, whereas the human locus is, a, is an 11-domain locus that makes up seven different genes, mm -hmm. and none of them are the same as the mouse one. So the mouse is actually not a great model for APOBAC3 okay. biology. Yeah. Um, Do you think it's, they're few because there hasn't been pressure, HIV-like pressure, to duplicate it? Uh, so that's a good point. So that brings up the bigger question of you know, what they're for. Mm -hmm. um, so our working model is the Apobex are one arm of the much broader innate immune response, and that different uh, mammalian uh, branches of the mammalian phy phylogenetic tree have, have experienced different pressures. And so depending on what their pressures are, they may have fortified the Apobex defense, or they may mm -hmm. have fortified a different innate immune defense. You know, through a lot of these genes, uh, one of the hallmarks is positive selection, and another one's duplication. So it just so happens that in the primate lineage, we're fortified for apobac 3s um, And we're actually shortchanged in some other arms of the, you know, we only have one trim, and it's no good against HIV. And uh, yeah. well, we have lots of trims, but one trim 5. Right, it uh, doesn't work instance. against HIV, right? Yeah. And so I think there's just different battles happening down these different lineages. And you know, we've got what we've got today, and we're not really sure why. But we could argue, based on its potency against retroviruses, that it's probably, you know, that, that retroviruses were part of the ancient selective pressures that drove the expansion. What about old world monkeys? Do they have lots of apobex? Um, so, good question. So we don't have yet a full good sequence of the locus. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a minefield in the genome for an old world monkey. Um, I guess, so rhesus and us are similar. Um, I, I would say they're pretty similar mm -hmm. from what we know so far. But there are lots of old worlds with their own SIVs, so it would be interesting to look at all of them, right? There's a ton of variation out there, yeah. both at the locus and among you know, the viruses that infect those and critters. And SIVs also have VIF, is that correct? They do. So all lentis except the uh, horse lentivirus mm -hmm. have VIF. So do horses have Apobex? Horses have Apobex, and that very cool lent um, lentivirus probably has another way around the Apobex, and that's an okay. uh, unanswered question in the area still. And not many people are working on it, I presume. Well, it's hard to get a grant on horses and yeah, I know. Horse, uh, equine infectious anemia virus. What about the caprine, the goat, right? Does that have uh, It does, Apobex and so does Madi Visna and uh, feline infectious 
uh, feline immunodeficiency yeah. virus? Oh, this is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Too bad we haven't talked about it before. Yeah. Nobody wrote 232. to 232. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. Well, maybe, uh, maybe you have to come back and talk in more detail sometime. Oh, that'd be fun. Next time you publish a paper, like next year or something. Or next week. That's a joke. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what is the one, so if you could think of one experiment that you'd like to be able to do or surrounding Apelbeck, what would it be? Oh, where's Eric? <laughs> See, him and his wife just had their second child this week, but I'm sure he's in the lab right now, not in the audience. Um, but one experiment we really want to do that's teed up that, that relates to what we're just discussing is mm -hmm. delete the locus from a human cell that's relevant um, okay. to ask how that impacts HIV, um, HIV replication and the overall rate of mutagenesis. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? We can, yeah. Modern genetic engineering <laughs> tricks. We heard about uh, uh, adeno-associated virus today, AAV, and you know, recombination in human cells works well enough that one can target loci and you can engineer chromosomes. Mm -hmm. We're working on it. All right, so you're going to work on it. You're going to take the whole locus out and then see what happens when. Yep. And your idea that HIV actually benefits by, from the mutation, you can test that directly. And you'll do that with and without VIF, I presume. Uh, we'll do it both. Yeah. Uh, we'll do it both ways. Cool. Uh, but the idea is in an isogenic system, so you know all the other variables can be controlled. Yeah. So uh, when will that be done? In a year's? Eric's not here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's working. Any on other it. students willing to take on this? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully soon. We've we've made progress. All right. So when you do that and publish it, will you come back on and talk about it? Deal. Can you do Skype? Absolutely. And here in Minneapolis, do you have Skype? Sure. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> as long as you're not on the U of M wireless, actually. <laughs> and we yeah, can do wireless. it with real cables. Yeah, we could do, get a wired connection. That'll be the way to do it. What, before we leave this, you mentioned that something about cancer in Apobex. And in, in, in someone who gave a talk from your lab talked about this today. What's the story there? Um, so it's a big story that's emerging still. Um, we, since we discovered the deaminase activity of these enzymes, have wondered about their role in cancer. And the trick has always been which cancer and which apobec, and because there are multiple family members and lots of different cancers. Um, we made some headway recently with breast cancer, um, yeah, okay. able to demonstrate that one of the apobecs, 3B, which is not mm -hmm. one of the ones that restricts HIV, um, is contributing up to half of all mutations in the subset of breast cancers that overexpress this enzyme naturally. So, um, but that's part of probably a larger iceberg um, out there because there are many cancers that are dominated by that kind of mutation. Mm -hmm. And there's other literature, particularly uh, a couple of nice papers from Mike Stratton's lab that demonstrates a mutational process um, through sequencing whole cancer genomes of clustered mutations mm -hmm. that they also call contagious mutational thunder showers. And these are really tightly clustered um, um, C to T mutational events, so that instead of being tens of KB away from one another on a chromosome, there can be dozens of mutations within a single kilobase. Mm -hmm. And these clusters are really only attributable to an apobec. And based on intrinsic biochemical signature, we would argue that that apobec is only apobec 3b. Uh, but this is you know, literature that is still being discussed. So are these apobecs induced in a transformed cell, or are they already uh, at high levels? Uh, so for this particular one, uh, most normal cells and tissues that we've ever looked at, which is you know over 20 different human tissues and tons of cell lines, um, it's not on, it's not expressed. Okay. Uh, but in a lot of different cancer cell lines and tissues, it is expressed. I see. And we don't know what the switch is that turns it okay. on. Okay, because that's the conventional wisdom is that as the cell is transformed, it's multiplying, it's accumulating mutations. But in addition, it is not correcting them. It's making more mutations than if it were just multiplying. So this yeah. may account for it. In part. It is um, effectively a simmering mutator. Yeah. So it is enabling the cancer cell to, to benefit from a higher mutation rate. That sounds like a big deal. We'll see. Yeah. It'll play Very out in the literature over the next uh, months. We'll have to do this week in cancer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ruben. Thanks. Roberto, possiamo parlare adesso? Non capirebbero. <laughs>
Um, I want to ask you about this program you have um, over at the Mayo Clinic. What is it called? The um, I'm getting text from my student who wants to order oligos. He said, can I order these sequencing orders? It's, uh, this is um, virology and gene therapy track. This is something you, you put together, is that right? What is it? Yeah, that's um, a graduate track of the Mayo Graduate School. Um, and um, about 15 years ago, Mayo um, had a problem. Uh, they had too much money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the institution uh, is committed to research. And they were trying to find something which will benefit the needs of the patients, because this is the mission of the institution. And something on which everybody agreed is gene therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, um, some wise people uh, were around and they said, well, in order to have gene therapy going, you need really to have virologists there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so the molecular medicine program was started, um, which after a few years um, decided that needed an academic arm. And the academic arm in the graduate school was named the virology and gene therapy track. I see. So students can elect to go into this track and they get trained to be to do gene therapy one day, right? That's um, the theory? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there are two types of students, the ones who are uh, really committed to the applications. And there are also the students who listen to TWIF and mm -hmm. uh, want to do virology. Uh, but it's, yeah, the, the students at Mayo tend to have uh, a main interest in the applications. Yeah. Yes. So this track would give you fundamental training, understanding how viruses work, but also specifically how you could use them, yeah. right? We have a core course which is taken by all the students of the track and, and each year by a few students of Mayo Graduate School in, in the other track, um, which is named Virology and Gene Therapy, but which takes the student to the principle of virology for 12 hours. Uh, this is based on your book and then there is a second Third, which is viruses to vectors. We basically mm -hmm. go over the principle once again, but with an eye on the application. And then we do gene therapy, and these uh, will basically discuss the gene mm -hmm. therapy, and, and the viruses are only uh, secondary there, and, and really is how uh, all the aspects of gene therapy. Right, because there are other ways to do it besides viruses, obviously, right? right. Although they're not as good. <laughs> so you, you spent the, most of your career in Europe, right? You came here from Switzerland? Yeah. Tell us about that, uh, your, your path. The first part of the career, or quickly, or why, why to come at me, or what, what do you want no, to do? So you, were you, where were you born, in Italy? I was born in a part of Italy which was taken over by the primitive canton of Switzerland. <laughs> More than 500 years ago, that's uh -huh. Lugano. Yeah. Lugano, okay. <laughs> and you grew up in Italy? With grew up in Lugano, uh, get all my schools with the Italian book. Um, was interested in both molecular biology and anthropology, and mm -hmm. the place where we had both of them was Geneva. Um, realized after a year, the second year, in, um, that anthropology, well, the professor of anthropology said during the first lecture, um, anthropology is not a science. Anthropology <laughs> is a vantage point. And I, I didn't understand it, but I understood it at the end of the year and decided that yes. molecular biology was really what interested me. And in fact, molecular biology was molecular virology at these times. Mm -hmm. So I ended up um, using viruses for my undergraduate. Uh, mm -hmm work, uh, moved to Heidelberg uh, for my PhD, um, uh, interviewed with different people. Um, Hein Schaller was working on hepatitis B virus. And somehow this virus, which just had been sequenced and was, sequenced and was 300, uh, 3,182 nucleotides long, the genome was simple enough. Uh, <laughs> for me to deal with. So I started on the simplest possible virus. Uh, showed uh, that it was infectious in 
chimpanzee, the DNA was infectious in chimpanzee. I mean, this, these were these times where people were putting together genomes and, and see if whether they were infected, whether the viruses were come out. Uh, move on to a virus which was five times more uh, complex for my postdoc, measles virus. And work on different aspects of measles virus. Um, Where was that? Zurich, Zurich. Switzerland, uh, back in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, came to the United States in 91, 92 to work with Jack Rose, uh, learn about cell biology. Uh, so, yeah, that's at Yale? Yeah, yes. <coughs> back to Switzerland started uh, my group. Um, decided, one well, that um, having worked a lot with replication of viruses, I was really getting interest in tropes and receptors and and making viruses into something um, better, <laughs> if possible, um, uh, making them into friends and um, into vectors which will uh, either deliver gene to correct uh, genetic diseases or then replicate conditionally in cancer cells and cure cancer. So that seemed a good idea to, mm -hmm. um, for starting a career and, um, and a that time, the Mayo Clinic was uh, had this problem with too much money, and somehow yeah. we found each other. So. I was surprised when you came here. Please, I was surprised when you came to Minnesota. Not that there's anything wrong with Minnesota, of course, but from Europe to Minnesota is unusual, right? Well, the culture is not so different. I mean, Minnesota was settled by uh, German and Scandinavian uh, settlers, so it's. Um, Maybe it's one, culturally, one of the uh, part of the United States which is more similar to mm -hmm. Europe. Not New York, then? Huh? Not New York. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about one aspect of what you do. Okay. Do you have any preference? Um, well, I could spe uh, speak about tropes of viruses or? Yeah, uh, or sure. T t I mean, the measles receptors story would be interesting <coughs> to hear from the, from the source. So tell us, can mm. you give us the overview? Right. Um, yeah, measles is one, uh, or there was Bob Domes at, at a meeting of, on, on entry, virus entry, years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so the discussion says something like, um, the first receptor, the first published receptor of viruses is usually not right. <laughs> <laughs> or not the right one. And, and obviously, poliovirus is the exception. <laughs> Could have been wrong. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what um, we know. But first one ever discovered was sialic acid for flu, right? Right. It, it turned um, out right. Yeah, no, I mean. I know, for I, the I, first I, one. Yeah. So that's the case for measles, it was wrong? Well, it's complicated. Again, it's, um, for many viruses, the first molecule or, or first entity which you find as a receptor is, is the entity which allows the virus to get in in a tissue culture dish right, of right. the type of cells which you happen to have in your lab or that you believe to have in your lab. Sure. Um, <laughs> and this, is, this can be different for something which is relevant in vivo. So it turns out that the first receptor for measles virus is a ubiquitous protein, which is probably connected with um, attenuation of the virus, um, mm -hmm. and, um, and which is not at all relevant for uh, pathology or for virulence. So this is CD46. Very important molecules. I mean, it's all, without this information, it would have been much more difficult to advance the fields, but. Again, um, then one goes on and, and tries to find something which is really relevant for a wild type virus. And uh, the Japanese group of Yuzuke Yanagi identified a protein which is expressed on um, immune cells, including mm -hmm. lymphocytes and dendritic cells and activated macrophages. And this is the primary receptor, the signal in lymphocytic activation molecule. And and uh, years ago, we realized that something was missing. It is the protein which um, allows the virus to get out of the system, to get into the epithelium, 
and out of the human to make Mises virus especially contagious. And, and we and other groups were after this receptor. And a couple of years ago, we, we found a protein which is expressed in the trachea and um, which let the virus get out exactly in the windpipe, mm -hmm. the place where the host will split it out uh, the furthest away and uh, will infect uh, most uh, other humans. So, right. so how does <coughs> measles is acquired by the respiratory route, right? You inhale it. Yep. And how does it enter? It enters, it's probably, well, um, well, it enters by first getting into immune cells, uh, dendritic mm -hmm. cells and macrophages, which, which are, in, are patrolling in the, the lungs okay, and, the and goes on these cells uh, through uh, within um, these immune cells. It uses these cells to pass the epithelial barrier, uh, then replicates in the local lymph nodes in the whole immune system within a few days you have a very uh, strong replication everywhere and uh, and again then then the problem was how it gets out of the system but this entry is mediated by slam primary yes everything is mediated by slam expressing these different types of cells and uh, but slam is not on the respiratory epithelium yes slam was the is conundrum right? exclusively in immune cells and, and the question is yeah, what let, which cellular protein let the virus get in into the respiratory epithelium? And we, we were looking for something on the basolateral side, mm -hmm. which is a completely different concept to what um, was expected before, which is something on the apical side, which will let yeah. the virus yeah. in. So why did you make this leap to think about the bottom of the, what made you do that? Well, this was an experiment. This is an interesting case of a reverse brain drain. <laughs> <laughs> there has been this brain drain from fundamental virology into gene therapy, but yeah. sometimes it goes the other way around. So the first, um, when we came into Minnesota, my first meeting of the American Society of Gene Therapy, um, I had a poster and uh, somebody from the University of Iowa came by, uh, Paul McRae and Patrick Sin, and they were looking, they were seeing that we were having a measles viruses expressing GFP and they were trying to collect um, any possible virus which was replicating in epithelia um, and, um, and see which one they wanted the glycoprotein and they wanted to put them on, on their vectors and, and make finally something which will enter efficiently epithelia from the apical mm -hmm. side and they make the control on the basolateral, putting the virus also on ah. the basolateral <laughs> side and nice. look what I mean it's for, uh, they had all done the experiment with all the appropriate controls and the result was completely clear. The virus was entering yeah. basolaterally 100 times more efficiently than apically. So mm -hmm. from that point we knew that yeah. the textbooks were wrong. Not my textbook. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't exist. At your, when, when was the first uh, edition of uh, uh, the late 80s I think. I don't oh, know. We of probably, your, the principle of error. Okay, and then yeah, we, we probably did. didn't even say there was a measles receptor at the time. I think we just, we don't tend to list all the receptors, we just talk about principles, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, not that we're not wrong on other things, but I don't think that one was it. So how did you end up identifying this basolateral protein? What was the approach? Well, again, it's, I think it's around 2005, uh, uh, we were convinced we had done experiments in, well, again, measles is a human virus which also infects primates. Primates are expensive, uh, $5,000 a piece. Um, you need to make a group of six. Um, so we try to make a mouse expressing measles virus receptor. It doesn't work. Um, so the logic, next things to do was to take an animal virus canine distemper um, which uh, infects dogs or ferrets, which cost 
30 times less than primates mm -hmm. and uh, make an express GFP and, and, and check that we were right, that measles first infects the immune system and then gets um, into the respiratory epithelium basolateri. So the first things to do was to be sure that these had right. a biological relevance. So that we did it, uh, 2003, 2004. In 2005, uh, Vincent Leonard, a postdoc from France, uh, um, was came to my lab to clone the epithelial receptor. Um, didn't get it, but uh, identified cell lines which expressed it again with one of these measles, wild type measles virus, which expressed GFP. It had three cell lines which expressed the receptor four cell lines which didn't um, use the cell lines um, to identify, so again, it tried to clone the receptor, didn't, but was able to make a virus which is selectively receptor blind, which has amino acid on the attachment protein, mm -hmm. which are mutated and which will not enter through this receptor. Used it in primates to demonstrate that um, the virus has to replicate in immune cells before, um, before replicating the respiratory epithelium. So that, that part was done. And then went back uh, to this set of cell lines, um, decided that the one which um, are permissive for the virus should express the receptor at high levels, the other at low mm -hmm. levels, and basically by differential screening try to identify it. It had to stop a little bit too early, but got help from Michael Müllebach, another postdoc who, in fact, had, um, was going back to Germany after being a postdoc in my lab to start this group and, and, and took that part of the project with him. And, and in his group in, in Germany, he identified um, by going down the list, as Vincent has done, he identified nectin-4 as, as a protein which was allowing entry mm -hmm. of uh, measles virus. And, uh, or wonder, not only it was a basolateral protein, as we predicted, but it was also expressed in the trachea, preferentially in the trachea. And had we known that, instead of doing that as number 15, our screening, or so we had done <laughs> it as number one, but it just shows that the viruses are more intelligent yes. than the scientists yeah, that and work on that. And of course hindsight is always 2020, right? So nectin is in the same family as the polio receptor, isn't, right. that, isn't that interesting? PVRL4 or nectin 4, yeah, I, I was confused at the beginning with this, what is this PVRL4? Uh, I didn't make the nomenclature. <laughs> when they, so I, we'd identified PVR polio receptor in 1988, I think. Yeah. And it was PVR, and then other people started identifying orthologs, and they gave it all kinds of names, but they never asked me. So, so then so yeah, don't blame PVR me. is obviously polio virus receptor, and yeah. then there is this like for it. yes, that's right, and or it could be polio Vincent Racaniello, which I really like. <laughs> <laughs> VR, okay, that's a great story. And now there are no other viruses that we know that do this, right? That exit via a special receptor. Not that we know yeah, that is not known yet. Um, I anticipate that there will, there will be, sure. There will so be. That's a great story. I like that very much. And we, we actually did discuss it a while ago, but it's good to hear it from you with your insights about how it developed. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I did hear this we, did we episode get it, of with. Did we uh, get it right? Uh, yeah, yeah. More or less. You always get it right. No, 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 right. but not always. <laughs> I, get, I have emails that testify that I don't get it right. So let's read these two emails. One is from Matthew, and um, he says, what's your opinion about the recent controversial study on bird flu transmission published last week in Science? And of course, we talked about it today. This is a study where Chinese scientists took H1N1 and H5N1 and made all the possible reassortants and found uh, specific gene exchanges that allow transmission in guinea pigs. I think this is a great study. I don't think it's dangerous or uh, in any way irresponsible, and I've written a blog post about it, which I'll link to, and you can read more of my thoughts. I think it's unfortunate that a couple of scientists have said negative things about it, and that's what the press is picking up. And this is really what we have to contend with. That's why we have to keep communicating on all fronts. 
Uh, Robin writes, can you suggest a few easy ways for a busy student or postdoc to break into social media to promote their research or develop their career? Um, so an easy way would be to use Twitter or Google Plus and just periodically post something there. You can get an account for free and you uh, can, when you find an interesting article that you want to share or a blog post written by someone else, you go and then slowly you will accumulate people following you if you put up interesting things. And if you, know, if you want to do this and you email me, I will put you on my list, which will automatically get you a lot of people. And then people will start to follow you. And then as you have more time, you can send out longer messages or get more engaged. I think that's a good way to start because it exposes you to the social media community. And it's quite big out there. And uh, it's pretty dynamic. And that is good for a student or postdoc. You don't have to write anything. You don't have to record a podcast. So I, I would recommend doing that. So that's Twitter.com and Google+. Plus. Uh, Twitter, you're limited to 140 characters. Google+, Plus, there's no limit. So if, you're, if you tend to write more, uh, Google+, Plus is good. And there's some very good science communities on Google+. Plus. I would join them. They're called Circles. And um, I, I, I do both because I try and do as many things as I can. But I like both, and they're both different. And you can do a thing on Google Plus called a Hangout, where you just fire up Google Plus, and if you have a camera on your laptop and a microphone, uh, people in your circles can all get together and chat. And the video is up, and it gets recorded automatically. And it's very, very nice. It's called a Hangout. So I've, I've done a couple of those about science as well. So that's what I would recommend. Uh, so this episode of uh, TWIV will be at the usual places, twiv.tv, iTunes, and if you like TWIV and what we do, the best thing you can do for now is to go over to iTunes and rate the show, give it a, some stars or, or a, a text rating, and that helps to keep it very visible in the Apple directory of podcasts. And that's what we want more people to find out about virology from virologists. And we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to TWIV at TWIV.TV. Lou Mansky. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Vincent. Lou is the director of the Institute for Molecular Virology, which, of course, is hosting TWIV today. Leslie Schiff is here also at the University of Minnesota, a professor in microbiology and associate dean. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Vincent. Did you you're have my, fun? You're my hero. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> my hero. Ruben Harris, IMV co-director and professor here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Real pleasure. And we'll have you back. Love you all back. And Roberto Catania at the Mayo Clinic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Vince. I like, I like saying your name. Can you say my name in Italian, too? <laughs> Ruben Harris. <laughs> <laughs> he just said it in New yeah. York. Yeah, that was, that was Jersey accent. <laughs> Leslie Schiff. Is that OK? That's Lou, good. Lou That's a good one, Lou Mansky. And uh, I am Vincent Racaniello. And you can find me at? virology.ws. I want to thank you, Lou, for yep. inviting me, the committee, again. all of you guys that came to this. I really uh, appreciate it. And I hope uh, you learned something that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>
smile. <laughs> All right. Can you count to 10? Do you have to put your thing on? Oh, yeah, he's got to put his thing on. It's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Got to get with the program. Yeah, it's okay. Is that good? Talk so they can hear you. Count to five. One, two, three, four, five. It's good, right? A little bit too much. One, two, three, four, five. Is that good? Everybody ready? Yes? What are we doing? Everybody's ready. I have no idea. We're doing twelve. Oh, that's right. <laughs>